My name is Margaret Gambaro, and I am the manager of Access Initiatives at Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. So, please, so welcome to our program today. Um, if you'd like, you can introduce yourself in the chat. Um, if not, you can just also relax and enjoy the program. But before we get started, I'm going to do a quick little intro. So at Intrepid Sea Air and Space Museum, our mission is to promote awareness, understanding of history, science, and service through its collection, exhibitions, programming in order to honor our heroes, educate the public, and inspire our youth. And one way that we live up to this mission is through our veterans initiative and through this veteran initiative um, all veterans and current service members are free to come to the museum so their tickets are free well when the museum's opened of course and also we have these programs that we do for veterans cur current service members and their families and during this time of covid that has been described multiple times as unprecedented we are so grateful that we were able to convert all of our veterans programs to this virtual space. And we are so happy to see that our veteran community has accepted this and are coming out for these virtual programs. So thank you, thank you for coming. Um, so just a quick little um, future program. So in July, um, July 21st, we will be having an Intrepid After Hours, which is for um, veterans and current service members only, and that will be kind of a behind the scenes look at um, Intrepid's collection. And it'll actually have um, Jessica Williams or her colleague, Danielle. So, you know, if you really enjoy Jessica, she's a cool gal come back and see her present some more. Um, so yes, and so we'll be doing that. And I believe sometime, I haven't picked out the date, but in late summer, early, uh, early fall, we will be having another um, Intrepid book club. So keep an eye out for those, um, for that information to come out. All right. So again, just some quick housekeeping. Um, we just ask for you to please keep your microphone um, keep your microphone muted during this time. And if you have any questions, please write them in the chat. And again, if you feel like introducing yourself, please also write that in the chat. And then we will get started talking about our presenters today and our program today. So today we are doing a very important program, something that is definitely more need to be coming out and it is all about sharing, collecting and sharing LGBTQ veteran stories. And for our panel today, we will have um, Jessica Williams will be up first and she is the curator of history here at Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum. Um, and then we will also be having Ashton Stewart, who is the, um, he is the, uh, sorry, whew, who is a part of um, Sage Vets. He's the program manager and he'll be talking about this awesome collection that Sage Vets just got. Uh, that is all these great, great artifacts from LGBT veterans. And then we will also have, finally, Petty Officer, second class, um, Luanda Mobley. And she served in the U.S. Navy during Operation Desert Storm from 1985 to 1997, prior to and during Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And following a promotion to Petty Officer, first class, um, she there is just some unfortunate incidents that happened that led to her dishonorable discharge. And she will be, or other than honorable discharge, sorry. It was other than honorable discharge. And um, she will be telling more about her experience in the, um, in the Navy and also what she has been doing since then. So yeah, so um, first, 
let. So now I believe it is time for me to hand it over to Jessica. Great. Thanks, Margaret. And hello, everybody. It's great to see all of you even at a distance. And thanks to all of you who are joining, um, joining our programs. I may have seen some of you before for other programs. And this is, as Margaret said, a really interesting um, and important topic um, and appropriate. Here we are at the very end of, of Pride Month. Um, this is a topic that, um, that we at the Intrepid Museum aspire to collect. So collect stories from LGBT veterans, but we haven't really achieved this yet. And it's something that's top of mind for us um, because it is so important for our collections to really capture the range of experiences on board Intrepid. This is very essential to our mission. It's very important to the work that I do personally and the rest of my department does. And what we find when we're collecting is that some, in trying to capture the, you know, the range and totality of crew experiences, some of the things we want to collect are much easier for us than others based on information we have and also based on our staff just bandwidth. So for instance, one thing that we try to do that's relatively easy for us is try to collect across time for the ship's service and also across the ship's hierarchy. So we want to have people in, represented in the collections representing World War II all the way up to the 1970s, people who you know, were brand new to the Navy, to the commanding officer, all the different jobs on board the ship. Oh, and I should say, when I say collections, for us that means physical artifacts like uniforms and souvenirs and gear and tools. It means archives, so people's correspondence, memos and official documentation. Um, it means media, so photos and oral histories, uh, or photos and video, and it also means oral histories, so recorded um, uh, uh, first person accounts of service. So getting a range of, of roles on board the ship is relatively easy. Um, we also have been working to collect items and stories that represent the racial and ethnic diversity on board the ship. And this is slightly more challenging for us to do, but something we've also been working on quite a lot. Um, I think at the time I started 12 years ago, we had one artifact in the collection that was attributed to um, a Black crew member, and now we have many more um, objects and stories. But this can be difficult because we don't have a lot of demographic information about the crew members who served on board Intrepid just based on the documents we have. And uh, it also is challenging because the Navy was over 90% white at the time Intrepid was in service. So there's fewer numbers of people to begin with. And also we noticed that people, that the crew member, established crew member networks tend to be mostly um, uh, white sailors. So trying to find um, some of the people of color who served on board the ship can be challenging, but we do, have some ways to do that. We look through um, cruise books and photographs to try to match names to faces to see if we can find those kinds of experiences. Um, for um, trying to collect these stories, LGBT veteran stories, um, this is even more difficult for us because this is something that's not really written down anywhere, right? There's not documentation that we have, at least based on the things that come to us. And so we are trying to and hoping to do more outreach to try to see who we can identify in, the, in our former crew member community to help make these um, connections with us. And one of the things that I think about a lot in how we tell stories about Intrepid is that um, we, there are thousands of former crew members of Intrepid who are in touch with the museum. But for most of those people, their service, they're, they're in touch with the museum or their families are in touch with the museum because that individual had at least a neutral experience, if not a positive experience. So they look back at their time in the Navy um, as something very formative for them in a positive way. They want to come and visit us. They want to take their family. And I think a lot about, you know, people who had a more challenging time, whether it's through from aspects of their identity, whether it's just because they hated the Navy, whether it's because they had disciplinary issues or other things, that those individuals are less connected to us as an institution. Um, understandably, right? It may not be the memories that people want to, want to connect with. So we are hoping through you know, our ability to connect with more people, through, um, you know, Ashton is going to describe this really fascinating archive that is going to find an institutional home that through more um, public collecting of this, that this will help us be able to make the connections um, that we want to make. And um, we also know that a lot of our collecting comes from people who are offering things to us. And while we do try to do some outreach, um, it's, it's 
it's one of the most rewarding things, but it's also one of the most challenging things of trying to go and find people who have never been in touch with us before. So I had done a little bit of this work um, when we were doing an uh, exhibition about our submarine to try to find people who've never been in touch with the museum. And I was able, in some cases, to find some really interesting stories. Um, you know, for instance, a guy who, after he left the Navy, became an anti-nuclear weapons activist, which is interesting. He had not been in touch with us before. Um, but in other areas where I was trying to contact some of the stewards mates who served on board the submarine, I ran into a lot of um, roadblocks there. So all this is to say is that um, I'm so grateful for this discussion. I think this is going to be really fascinating and learning experience for me. And I'm hoping that, you know, we're pre we are pretty clear eyed about the work that we want to do and need to do. And so, um, you know, uh, it's a great moment to really think about how we can um, expand our collections and hopefully um, uh, uh, bring more of these stories to the public and to our collection. So that's, that's, that's it for me. Um, and now I get to get to listen a bit. Thank you so much, Jessica, Charlotte, and Margaret, and the Intrepid and the Veterans Initiative for inviting Stage to honor pride with you today. We are thrilled to be working with you and discussing the importance of collecting and sharing LGBTQ veteran stories, and also a little bit about the evolution of the anti-LGBT policies in the US military, and trying to discuss the challenges that we face and the military museums face in collecting these stories and archives. Um, so a little bit about SAGE. Um, as we're celebrating Pride, uh, we celebrated Juneteenth this month. We're also observing PTSD mental health awareness, um, which also takes place in June. Um, SAGE started uh, in 1978 to address some of the needs of the elder LGBT community. Um, it's, it's, it's really a challenge um, um, for uh, discrimination, obviously. Isolation is a big item, uh, violence, um, and a mainstream institution distrust um, that stems from family who uh, historically have ostracized, ostracized uh, members of the family who do identify as LGBT, uh, religious institutions, police, um, healthcare providers have been known to discriminate, and certainly, certainly the military um, when they did have anti-LGBT policies. Um, since 1978, SAGE has flourished into a national organization. And in 2014, they started the SAGE Vets program, which is a New York State program for older LGBT veterans, 50 years and older, which is a little bit lower of an age uh, for uh, many of the programs at SAGE. And it's uh, for anybody that served in the US military or the National Guard. And we basically have a three-pronged approach. Uh, we educate, advocate, and commemorate. And unpacking that means uh, we work with providers to make sure that they're aware of some of the challenges that elder LGBT veterans face. Um, that way they're prepared when they do encounter these individuals so that they know uh, what to say, what to ask, and what not to say. Um, we also advocate for those individuals, making sure that they do get access to the benefits and programs that are available to them. And we commemorate their service. Uh, we've worked with the State Division of Veterans Services, for instance, to put together a Vietnam Veterans Recognition event. Uh, we got signed proclamations from the governor. It was incredibly moving. Um, we had about 50 veterans come who served either in country or during the Vietnam era. And this is the kind of work that we've been doing. Um, I've been with SAGE now for a little over two years and I've learned a lot. Um, I'm a veteran myself, US Navy, first Gulf War. And I love this job. I, I couldn't tell you um, a better place for me right now. Um, I, I'm grassroots, social advocate, for my entire life, um, I went into the military as a Canadian. Um, I'm, I've got dual citizenship now, um, and not through the military. I did that on my own. Um, but I, I just really, uh, I, when I moved here, I was just enamored by America, um, by the freedom and uh, the liberty and justice for all is what has always just made me just feel so welcome here. Um, and so I just try to promote that for everyone. Um, regardless, regardless of their backgrounds. And um, that's what this program is about. A little bit about the history of LGBT policies in the service. They didn't have an official anti-LGBT policy until 1949. And that lasted through 1993 when they implemented Don't Ask, Don't Tell. This sort of is a crossover for the Intrepid, which was in service in 1943, um, all the way through uh, Vietnam. Um, saw a lot of action. Um, 
so they've seen a lot of people passing through their their um, their ship and, and that command and hopefully we'll start finding some of the LGBT people um, that can start to share some of these stories as well. Um, so since that time, uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell ended in 2011, but between World War II and 2011, there are over 114,000 discharges for sexual orientation and gender identity. And this is a huge significance for those individuals. Um, a lot of them are certainly unwarranted, but there was just a whole slew of stories of discrimination um, and harassment uh, that could have led to other situations that led to the discharge, whether it uh, be AWOL, uh, somebody going AWOL because they just couldn't stand it anymore, or substance abuse. There's just a whole myriad of things that are related to this discriminate, discriminatory policy. Um, since that time, there's been a lot of change uh, that they had the transgender ban lifted for a few years, which was wonderful. Um, fortunately, it got re-implemented again in April of 2019 by the current administration. Um, and then we have the Restoration of Honor Act that Governor Cuomo just announced on Sunday uh, for Pride Sunday. Um, the State Division of Veteran Services is uh, leading the charge here on evaluating discharges for anybody who was discharged for sexual orientation, gender identity, PTSD, traumatic brain injury, and, um, and I think that's all of them, and MST, military sexual trauma. So what you can do is you can apply to the State Division of Veteran Services, explain what happened, um, and they will give you an upgrade to honorable. And this is more about a healing. This is more about bringing in people who Jessica was talking about, the people who don't identify as veterans, the people who served, who yet are not comfortable taking that identity. Um, and that's problematic. Oftentimes, um, there's a lot of programs out there that would benefit these individuals and they are not taking advantage of them. So that's why it's imperative and a crucial that Sage Vets continues this work. We're so grateful for the support we get from the state legislature, from the city council, um, and we're just, we've been preserving these stories. We've been working with different groups to talk about these issues. Um, we're working right now with the Library of Congress to preserve some of these stories. We've been working exclusively with the VA. Uh, they have a very robust LGBT veteran care coordinator program. Certainly they're very aware and uh, competent on giving mental health support to veterans. Unlike some of the other providers who don't necessarily understand the veteran experience, the VA is really a great place for that. Uh, we also worked with the New York Historical Society, and we're currently working with the Intrepid. And one of the people that has been so courageous in sharing her story is Lawanda Mobley, who is with us today. And I'm just delighted. Um, the, the intro of her service was already shared, but I just want to add that she's been such a leader in helping other veterans with their challenges. Uh, she did a really moving video with Make the Connection. Uh, VA program that's online and she's also part of a panel that we did last year with the VA in Northport with veterans from World War II, Vietnam and the Persian Gulf Wars to share their stories, their LGBT stories and try to bring people up to speed on some of these issues that uh, are really challenging at times. Um, so I want to pass the mic <laughs> over to Lawanda so she can just share a little bit about what it was like for her to serve um, during the, uh, she served both during and prior to Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So thank you. Thank you, Ashton. Uh, thank you, Jessica, Margaret, Charlotte. I'd like to thank the Intrepid for making this possible. You know, um, as, as I'm sitting here, um, listening to everything that everybody has to say. I have this little thing that, that tells me you're not qualified. Why, why do they want to hear from you? And, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the reality and the backstory to that is I didn't have issues because of my sexuality. Um, but now that I, I'm, I'm out of the Navy, I work for the VA, I receive services for the VA, and I've taken a look back at some things that happened. I realized that some of those things that happened may have happened because I was a lesbian. So, um, you know, my, my first tour of duty was Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and uh, it was in 1985. And when I got there, 
Um, you know, I wasn't intimidated by anything, but I just naturally fell in. There was a group of lesbians and I fell in with them, but we all knew that speaking about our sexuality, being open about our sexuality was something that we could not do. But because there was a group of us, we were comfortable with each other, but we knew never to talk about it and um, you know, to behave accordingly when, when we were on duty. My next duty station was uh, Groton, Connecticut. And now that I think back, there really weren't that many LGBT people there. So I just continued on with my life. I, I, I had a partner, my partner lived with me and you know, I had my, my life when I was working and I had my life that I was very careful to shelter when, when I was not on duty. And then I found out that I was going to sea duty my, my first vessel was the USS Hunley, a submarine tender. And uh, after talking to some people, I realized that a new challenge was going to be posed because I had always lived out in town. I had always had VHA, BAQ and been authorized to live in town. I never lived in the barracks. Now that I was going to sea duty, I was gonna have to live on board ship and that posed some challenges. Um, back in, this was the early 90s, we only, females were only allowed to serve on tenders. And the majority of the tenders had a reputation of being called the love boats because it was a challenge to have men and women. Men and women on shore duty is one thing, but men and women on a seagoing vessel in tight quarters was a totally different situation. So I did something after speaking to some other homosexual veterans that uh, I, I know now was not that uncommon, I married a man and I married a man so that nobody would question my sexuality, irregardless of the person that I present and, and my demeanor, that no one would question my sexuality. She's got a husband. Now, mind you, this was in the early 90s. That worked very well for me um, until I got to my third ship. And I was a second class when I got to my first ship, so I was senior enlisted. So I didn't have to do a lot of the things that the, the E1s, E2s, and E3s did because I was already a shop supervisor. So I wasn't subject to the duties and things that they had to do. And I had some degree of respect by the time I came on board by virtue of the fact that I was already a supervisor. Um, I got to my third ship, which was the last ship I served on, the Emory S. Land out of Norfolk, Virginia. And I reported on board September of 1995. And December of 1995, I found out that I had passed the exam and been selected to be promoted to Petty Officer First Class or E6. And, um, you know, I was new on board this ship. They knew that I was married but they didn't know anything about me. My other ships, people didn't really say anything to me because I was married by the time I got there. But looking back on it now, um, the fact that I was a black female, that I had been not, well, I only, Only knew one other black female. Um, somehow, some uh, uh, details, some things occurred. And uh, cocaine, basically, I was self medicating and I ended up popping positive on a urine screen. And at the time it was zero tolerance in the Navy. But I, I remember clearly that I had seen, and this is no offense to any of the white males that are on here. I'm just giving you my experience when, when, when during the time that I served, I saw a lot of white males get in trouble for substance abuse and they were offered treatment, sent away for a while and they came back to work. They might've lost some pay, they might've lost um, they might have even been reduced in rank, but uh, 
I wasn't offered any of that. Um, because I was caught in the grips of addiction, I didn't realize I was caught in the grips of addiction because, you know, everybody drank. Every, everybody partied. Everybody even drank to excess at times because the most important thing was that we came to work the next day, irregardless of the condition we were in. So I fell into that culture. But I, I realize now, looking back in retrospect, um, I denied the use of the drugs. And I also didn't tell anybody what had happened or what was going on because A, in order for me to speak on what was going on, I would have had to have revealed my sexuality. And the fact that I was so excited about finally being promoted to E6 after trying all those years, I, 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 didn't, I didn't see any other option than to, to comply with, with what was going on. And, and I know now that I'm going for treatment for PTSD, consent and compliance are two different things. And that's extremely helpful. Back, I'm sure that my other than honorable discharge and the fact that I was not even offered rehab had something to do with the fact that somebody knew that I was a lesbian. And I wasn't in a position because of the substance abuse to even stand up for myself at the time. So I got thrown out. I was angry. I could not acknowledge my veteran status, even though it was only an other than honorable discharge. And, you know, I, I continued to use for, for the next 13 years. Um, the reason that, that I am so willing to do anything that Ashton asks, asks of me and be an advocate is because I'm finding out there's a lot of people with similar stories to mine and worse stories than mine and that, 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 aren't, that aren't talking about it. You know, um, I'm in a program of recovery and one of the things that I'm very clear on is we're only as sick as our secrets. And a lot of the things that happened to me, I'm just now able to talk about them and even remember them because there are things now that I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with, with a women's group and, and with a, a therapist, there are things that I'm remembering. And, um, you know, there were things that I guess I just wasn't willing to see for what they were when I was enlisted in the military. Like I worked on nuclear submarines the entire time that I served on shore duty and on sea duty. And women didn't serve on submarines, only men did. And I did have the opportunity to meet some men who were gay that served on submarines. Now you wanna talk about a challenge to be a gay man and be on a submarine in those close quarters. Some of the stories that I heard about the things that happened and the treatment that these men would receive you know, it was enough to keep me, for all intents and purposes, in the haze gray and underway closet and, and do everything that I could within my power to not have anybody find out that I was a lesbian. And at some point in time, that takes a toll on you because I was really leading a double life. We all were. We could be ourselves when we were out in town, but we still had to be careful. Like if we wanted to go to bars, you got to go to bars, not in the city that you live in, not in the city where you're stationed at for fear of being found out. And don't ask, don't tell. I don't, you know, I really don't believe that that changed anything. It was on paper, but I still saw people thrown out because of their sexual orientation and just the fear that that puts in you. Now, I loved my time in the Navy and that's a huge contradiction because it, I could not be myself the whole time I was in. You know, I'm, I'm getting choked up just thinking about it. Um, and the main reason I participate in these things is so more people, and I applaud the Intrepid for doing this because more people that served need to tell their story. And not just for the people that are serving now, but for the people that 
can get that upgrade and upgraded my discharge because I got another than honorable. I, I have I have medals, I have Navy achievement, I have ribbons. My performance record was stellar. This is the only thing that tainted it. And if I look at the mitigating circumstances, I'm not going to blame my sexuality on my discharge. I can't. And yet I'm not going to blame the Navy either. And and that's that's it's a hard pill to swallow. Um I look at everything that happened. I went through everything that I went through so I could get to where I'm at right now and help somebody else. Um, I did a make the connection video and you know the caption that they put on my video out of everything that I said was, um, I did it so you don't have to. I thank every single one of you for, for participating and, and coming out to um, listen to, to you know what I had to say, to what Ashton had to say, and to be a part of this. Uh, I, I look forward to working with Ashton or anyone that, that has a need to get the voice and get the stories out there. You know, I met Ashton at Castle Point VA in June, right after he started the position he's in now. He was the speaker at our Gay Pride event and Ashton and I went off to the side and talked for about 30 minutes, and I've been working with him ever since. I've never said no to anything he's asked me to do, and I'm not going to say no. You know, the big thing is I'm only as sick as my secrets, and I'm okay with who I am, and I'm okay with what I went through. And if I can help just one person, then I know I didn't go through it for anything. Um, I don't want to ramble. I don't want to get off target. Um, I'm, I'm grateful. You know, I, I thank God that I survived and I know that he has a plan for me. And part of that plan is continuing to do the things that I'm doing right now. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and turn it over to the Intrepid team and, and thank you all for participating in this, in this uh, discussion today. Wow. Thank you, Luanda, for sharing. And also thank you, Ashton and Jessica, for sharing, too. Uh, right now, we are going to open up the chat for any questions. Um, like I said, please keep your mic uh, muted, but we do ask for you to type any questions that you might have in, um, in the chat. Thank you, Margaret. And while these are coming in, these questions, uh, Luanda, thank you so much. Um, I, I am so proud of everything that you all shared. You just are such a wonderful person. And if I had say in the military, I would definitely pick you to be in my military. You are so dedicated and such a wonderful person. And this is essentially what Sage Vets is about and the purpose is just to try to elevate these stories and, and, and try to move forward and try to end that discrimination. We are putting together an archive. We are very fortunate um, that one of our veterans who's been part of the Sage program for some time collected uh, an extraordinary amount of posters and documents, flags, military records, uniforms, and other memorabilia that uh, tracked the whole process of when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was implemented, the march that, marches that went to DC to, to uh, pro uh, say, no, this is not the answer. Um, and we're working with the State Division of Veteran Services, who have always been so su supportive of this program, um, who are helping us get in touch with the curator, or the director, excuse me, at the uh, Military Historical Museum in New York State. Um, one of the things that we've got to do now that we've got this huge archive is to go through it and, and find out exactly what's there. Um, but this is a big first step. And uh, COVID, unfortunately, um, set us back a little because the archiving and, and, and finding out what's there is the first step. Um, so that way we can work with the museum. And also, if we find anything in there for the Intrepid, believe me, I'll be calling you, Jessica. <laughs> um, but one thing I just also want to add, I participated in my very first uh, virtual um, corporate pride event the other day. And one of the speakers was Lieutenant Colonel Bree Fram, who is currently on active duty as an astronautical engineer in the United States Air Force. 
transgender woman and the highest ranking transgender service member currently. Um, and she spoke about the trans ban being put back in a place and it's just crushing. I mean, she's, she was like, you are saying people with good brains aren't qualified because of the bodies they're in. Um, and it's just, it just chokes you up. It's just, it's so wrong. Um, but she also made the valid point that saying all of these myths of discrimination and reasons why you, or why people would say that transgender people shouldn't be allowed, we're all blown away because of the great job that she and other transgender people have done in the service. They were allowed to be who they are freely for three years. And now they're calling themselves an endangered species because there is no longer a policy allowing transgender veterans to serve. And one of the things that we did this year, which is really powerful, is uh, Senator Brad Hoylman nominated the very first transgender veteran into the New York State Senate Veterans Hall of Fame. Renee Imperato, who's been part of SAGE for some time, huge, powerful person, uh, served in Vietnam, has been very active in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and this is how we do it. We break down these cultural institutions that have not been fair. And we're saying, look, there's other people in this group of veterans or this group of whoever that needs to be recognized. And these stories need to be talked about openly. Let's normalize it. So thank you, um, Margaret, <laughs> take the question. Oh, thank you, Ashton, and thank you for, again, sharing about the amazing um, archive that Sage Vets has and can only imagine the undertaking to go through all of that. Um, so yeah, so it looks like we only had one question, which Charlotte already answered in the chat, but we can also maybe talk about this a little bit more, and that was... Um, Steve McClure asked, um, when did Don't Ask, Don't Tell begin? And it was in 1994, but I was just wondering if Luanda or Ashton can talk maybe a little bit more about that too. I would ask Luanda to address that because of the fact that she served both prior to and during, and uh, would love to hear your perspective on how the culture of the military changed during those two times. So um, Ashton, when, when was it implemented? Because I was a kid, 1991? 1993. Okay, 1993. Or, so yeah. um, I know that would mean that from, from 85, to 91 when I served, I know it was just something that wasn't spoken about because there were so many people for uh, that, that were homosexual that were serving. Um, you know, they didn't really bother us, but when I was on shore duty, they didn't bother us as long as we did our jobs. And I do know for a fact that I had been told that once I was going on board ship, that's where I got the idea to get married because if they found out while I was serving on board a ship, that, that, that would have been the absolute end of my career. I do remember vividly though, when it was implemented, um, myself and, and all the other uh, people of, you know, all the other homosexual, lesbian and gay people, we laughed about it because we were like, what is this really going to change? They're still going to come after us and we're not going to change being closeted with our personal lives. We thought it was a joke. You know, we, we knew that that would not protect us because if they wanted a reason to get rid of us, even though their primary reason was our sexual orientation, they would find another reason and there was nothing that we could do about it. So, um, Myself and the people that I associated with, we, we, we knew it was a joke. And, you know, we can, we can look back now and say, people were still thrown out. So don't ask, don't tell meant, okay, you can't ask me. Or if you ask me, I don't have to tell you. That was a joke. It, it, was, it was something that was on paper, but they didn't abide by it. So to us, it was a big joke. 
Thank you, Rolanda. Um, so do we have any more questions coming in? Are you saying that would like to be addressed or more subject? Let's give it a second. While we're waiting on that, Margaret, um, I just want to add that it, since it is PTSD Awareness Month, um, it, I would be remiss not to talk about this just for a moment. Um, these discriminating policies that have affected people um, who have served our country are and compounded by the unique challenges LGBT people face, um, isolation, discrimination, violence, uh, um, it, it can take a toll on someone's mental health. Um, and if it's not treated, and if we don't do anything about it, and to say that was a wrong decision to have those policies and try to help these individuals heal. Um, we all know the statistic all too well that there are 21 veterans every day that take their own lives. And this is staggering. And they've realized that Sage Vets works with older people and 65% of the veterans who do die by suicide are over the age of 50. In addition to that, the American Journal of Public Health did a study in 2012 that reported more LGBT veterans reported suicidal ideation compared with heterosexual veterans, which they attribute to perceived social isolation due to homophobia and heterosexism. So this is the time to just continue to move forward to end these discriminating practices and share these stories as Lawanda said, to help others come forward and make that phone call. The Restoration of Honor Act is one of the ways that we can do that. And although the Restoration of Honor Act is only addressing other than honorable discharges, it doesn't address those punitive discharges, which could also have been unwarranted and oftentimes are. That includes misconduct, bad uh, um, AWOL, or um, dishonorable. Those can be upgraded as well. It does take a little more work. We do have to go through the federal government for those upgrades, but it is possible. And if anybody has questions about this process or the, the Legislation Restoration of Honor Act, I encourage you to contact the rest, uh, New York State Division of Veterans Services or contact me at Sage Vets. We'll get you and point you in the right direction and we'll make sure that you're getting the attention that you deserve. Um, if I may, I saw, I saw a question in there, uh, did my husband know that I was gay? Yes, my husband did know because my husband was also gay. I had known, I had met him. He was a very good friend of mine back, uh, well, back here in New York where I'm from. And uh, it, it was also suggested that, you know, I marry another homosexual. And what we would have to do is he, did not reside with me. He lived, he stayed in New York. So what we told everyone that I was stationed with was, you know, because of his job, we couldn't reside together. And maybe once or twice a month, he would come to my house. We had everything set up to look as if he lived there and we would have dinner parties. So the people that I worked with got to meet him. And I gotta tell you that that was, that was challenging. Um, I don't know that any of my shipmates ever caught on that this was a uh, arranged situation because him and I were very close friends. Nobody ever spoke of it, but you know, that's the role you had to play. I couldn't just have the marriage license saying this is my husband and turn that in to be part of my permanent enlisted record. I also had to play the role, which became challenging. And um, he, so yeah, my, my husband knew, and of course my husband knew, um, and you know, um, I, I'm kind of, now that I'm the person that I am now, I'm, I'm, it's almost shameful that I had to do that because I lived a lie for a very large portion of my life to protect myself and my career. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, we have a few more questions that are coming in. Um, the first one is, and this can be, all three of you can, an, can have your own answer to this, and it is, what can the community or an organization such as vet to vet do to help with your goals? Did that question come from Larry? Sorry about that. Yes, it came from Larry Newman. <laughs> Larry, Larry and I know each other. We work together. That's why he, uh, when I saw him in there, you know, I am, uh, I'm on the, the drug court team here in the city of Middletown, and as part of that, we've, we've worked with Justice for Vets, and I, I've worked with Vet to Vet. Um, our, our primary focal point has been veterans with substance abuse problems. Um, the, the, the biggest challenge is that I haven't encountered many homosexual veterans that, you know, have come forward and 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 want to talk about their experience and, and and that were discharged other than honorably or dishonorably because of other things that they may have done i haven't encountered many i've i've had a lot of encounters with uh men and women who now have substance abuse problems who were discharged with those substance abuse problems i've i've helped men and women who have mst which is military sexual trauma for you that for you all that don't know um and you know, I've worked with Make the Connection. I don't, I don't know how we can better tell the community of veterans that we exist because one of the biggest problems is they don't or won't for whatever reason acknowledge their veteran status. And that was my position when I got out because I had an other than honorable discharge, even though I served for 12 years, I did not see myself as a veteran until I stopped using and I started um, talking to some people and getting in recovery because I re-enlisted three times. So I have two honorable discharges and all you need is one honorable discharge to receive services from the VA. And I've helped a lot of veterans with that. My final discharge was an other than honorable, but my first two were honorable. And by virtue of my honorable service during a period, I'm entitled to receive veterans benefits from the Department of Veterans Affairs. And I've helped other veterans that are in the same position get their benefits. Thank you. Um, Jessica or Ashton, do you have anything to say? Just a reminder, the question was, what can the community or an organization such as vet to vet do to help with your goals? Well, I appreciate that question so much, Larry. Thank you for asking it. Uh, Larry Newman, um, who's running the Vet to Vet program in Orange County has been a staunch supporter of this program. Um, he invites people like me um, to talk about the, this Sage Vest program and some of these issues. Um, and that is an extreme important part of how to address these shortcomings. Um, he runs task force meetings and invites veteran service providers from the entire surrounding county and adjacent counties um, to hear these about these programs so that way they have more uh, available to them when they're offering services to veterans. Um, every veteran is a veteran, um, which I hear often, but the experience in the military is not the same. Um, whether you're a woman, whether you're a person of color, whether you're LGBT, um, or whether you're in combat or not, uh, these all take a different toll um, based on the experience prior to going in the service, based on experience of who you are. Um, and so the more that veteran service providers know about these issues and about resources that they can add to their, their tool belts, um, the better off we will all be. Um, and one of the things that uh, we, we're celebrating Pride this month, and, and it's not just a celebration of, of of being LGBT, it's a celebration and a time to reflect on the struggles faced by LGBT people that have gone on for, for so, so long, far too long. Um, and and it's, these people are, are like constantly having, or living and having to defend who they are. Um, and whether it's fighting for policies or changes to existing policies, um, the fight continues and we can't let our guard down. We want to continue to promote a culture of respect and acceptance for diverse LGBTQ communities, and, and that's what we're striving for. And um, uh, and for, you know, from our perspective, I think any of these 
um, opportunities for veterans to speak to each other, you know, and as both Ashton and Melanda have said, just to get these stories out there so, pe so they are more publicly available. Um, even just hearing about somebody who is like you or had a similar experience, open up the possibilities um, to think about your own experience um, is just helpful for us. I mean, we think about it a lot in a historical perspective, but of course, you know, many intrepid former crew members are still around today. It's still very much living history and we want to be able to reflect that history um, ultimately in the museum. So I hope one day that people will be able to walk in and see some of these stories and then maybe, you know, reflect on their, their own experience or just have a broader view of what um, life was like on board. Great, thank you. Um, so we do have two more questions. Um, the first one is a two-part question from Toby Weiss, and it is, did the discrimination against LGBT military influence your view of the military and are your sense of patriotism? And then how would you describe the emotional impact on your feelings towards your service? Okay. Ashton, you wanna go first? Okay, I'll go. Um, could you repeat the first part of that again? I was concentrating on the second part, I'm sorry. Of course, no, it's a long question. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Did, um, did the discrimination against the LGBT military influence your view of the military and or your sense of patriotism? Uh, well, for me, I, I, would, I would have to say no, you know, and, and that's my perspective because I'm a black female and I was raised in upstate New York and we were the only black family where I went to elementary school at the time. So I was unfortunately exposed to the fact that some people just aren't tolerant of other people because of their differences. The difference of the color of my skin is quite evident. Um, and those people that, that get to know me, you know, Anybody that knows me just by the way I dress and the way I act, I had shared this before, they, they can assume that, that I'm a lesbian and I automatically get treated differently. So I was already acclimated to being discriminated against and treated differently, which also made it real easy for me to become a chameleon and take on another personality and people please to do other things to get people to like me. So no, I didn't. I didn't look at that as the Navy as an institution. I just looked at that honestly as people being who they are and who they can be. And that's and sometimes people are just intolerant of people that are different than themselves. I, I, I had known that from the time that I was in elementary school. I joined the military because I didn't really have many options, um, like many people that sign up with the military. Um, I'm from a low-income family. Um, I was new to the country, and I, I also needed to get out of the house. Um, my parents had a lot of issues, and I just wanted to be on my own. And again, I was just really enamored by uh, America. I mean, I grew up in a small town in Canada. Um, I moved to Nashville, Tennessee, two days before my 11th grade. Um, so it was sort of a fish out of water. Um, I didn't really know what I was in for, um, but I was really willing to put my life on the line um, for a cause that I believed in, liberty and justice for all. Um, and that, you know, that doesn't mean that you lay down and just follow orders without saying, well, wait a second, you know, what about this directive? You know, this doesn't, fit into that liberty and justice for all. Um, and when you ask those questions, it doesn't go very well. Um, so my experience wasn't that rosy. Um, so I was one of the people that took a long time to, to wear the identity as a veteran. Um, and still sometimes I, I feel like when Luanda was saying earlier, like, I don't feel like I should be talking about this. Um, I still feel that insecurity sometimes myself um, but that's why I, I 
don't go alone. I bring people in like Luanda, um, because together I feel like we can share a couple of perspectives that really sort of paint a more complete picture um, of equality and, and striving for liberty and justice for all. What a great thing to strive for. And I'm just so proud to, to be working toward that every day. Great. Um, so I will do a quick time update. So it is 1258 and we still have one more question, but if you're okay to like stay a little bit longer than one, I understand, but if you need to hop off at one, we totally get it. And thank you for coming. Um, so our next question is, um, as of today, if you are, oh, and this is from Yashira Middleton. And it is, as of today, if you are, a, are lesbian, gay, or homosexual, how do, um, how do they get treated in the military? So just kind of, yeah. From, from what I've been told, and Ashton could probably better answer this, uh, you know, times have changed drastically. Um, they are definitely, more tolerant than they were when, when during the time that I served. You know, I don't associate with many people that are that are active duty, um, and I haven't really had the opportunity, even though I work at a VA hospital, to to talk to to you know um, people that uh, prefer same sex partners. So I, I couldn't honestly answer that question. I was discharged in 1997. Ashton, can um, you shed any light on that? Maybe possibly, or Larry? Larry works with maybe younger vets that might be able to answer that. I could answer partially. Um, it depends on what command you are serving. Um, some are a lot more accepting than others. Yeah, uh, but the policy itself, I mean, we are expected to toe the line and follow orders. And I still think that that is still a struggle for some people that um, have morality or religious reasons for that they justify their discrimination on. Um, I think it's difficult for, for people sometimes. Uh, I just did an event this month, um, a virtual pride event with Fort Drum in New York State, and they were super supportive. Um, so it just depends. Uh, I've heard great stories. I've heard people that were serving prior to Don't Ask, Don't Tell that were pretty open about their sexuality and they were not cis they were not cisgender straight people. Um, uh, and it just totally depends on where you're serving. But I think the one thing that is a safety net right now is that LGB people can serve openly. Um, and we just need to remember that and do everything we can to encourage those who don't support it to talk about why they don't, because everybody's voice is important. Sometimes it's not uh, necessarily they're not on the right track for what their points are of discrimination are, but talking to them about it, sharing our stories um, is a pathway to, to getting them to open up. And sometimes they'll even share a story with you that they, they've known somebody who close to them who uh, identifies as LGBT. Um, and that's the starting point. And you say, wow, you know, that's really great that you shared that. It shows that you can be open-minded to somebody that's different than you. And let's apply that to a broader spectrum here. Thank you, Ashton. Um, thank you. Um, and then, yes, and also um, Verna Martin said that she can maybe add a little bit to that question. Um, I guess, Verna, if you have uh, just a minute to say something, because again, just being respect, respectful of time, it is 102. So if anybody needs to hop off, I totally understand. Okay, thank, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Ashton. Thanks for sending the email. I relocated here to Georgia from uh, New Jersey, New York. I have to say, since I've been here, um, the organization that I'm affiliated with, we went out to um, Dobbins Air Force Base. I retired U.S. Army um, 2001. I did 22 years. Um, so we went out to Dobbins Air Force Base to feed the reservists who had come back. Um, and that was my first time being in contact with, I would say, active, because for me, 
reservist, active guard, it doesn't matter. You're wearing a uniform, you're doing your best to serve this country. And to see this young man come in and his tailored BDUs with a twist that Marilyn Monroe would have admired. I was stunned and I was happy to see that he was not being looked down upon. Um, he was treated like everyone else, regardless. I don't know if it was because it was reserved, but I have to agree with what um, Lawanda said. It depends on your leadership. It depends on the people around you. So um, did I see that during my time? Um, once or twice, randomly, rarely. It depends, again, on the leadership. So that, that's my answer. Thank you for allowing me to comment. Yes, thank you, Verna. Awesome. You. Um, so we will wrap it up. Um, so again, thank you to Jessica, Lawanda, Ashton for coming in and talking about, again, this very important subject. Um, and for anybody who would like to um, come to more of our events for Intrepid, it's our website is intrepidmuseum.org slash vets. And then there's also Sage Vets. So if you need, so if you are um, an older LGBT veteran and need resources, please reach out. Um, so yeah, well, thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you, everybody.